Hello there, and welcome to my Scream 6 spoilerish review. Well, hang on. Oh, I can't breathe in this bloody... How do they kill people in this? You can barely breathe in the bloody thing. They're running around all over the shop with this thing on. Oh. Right, so, Scream 6. Now, I did a spoiler-free review. You can go check that out if you want to. Basically, I'm going to mention the same sort of stuff in that that I do in this, but with more context. Because you can do that with this now. I've got a bit more context. So, did I enjoy Scream 6? Yes, I did. Me and my partner, Laura, we both went to see Scream 6, and we loved it. We both laughed at the funny bits. We both, like, jumped at a few sections. My girlfriend especially, she's very jumpy at films. She's not a big, big horror fan like I am, but she she enjoys to come watch them with me sometimes. A few of the, <laughs> funny, a few of the trailers that come on before this for, like, the, the Pope's uh, Exorcist and the Evil Dead, and she just kept going, you can watch that by yourself. You can watch that one by yourself. But, like, this one... Because Scream's a bit more light-hearted. She, she really likes Scream. So she loved it as well. She jumped quite a, lot, a few times, like really big-time jumped. Um, a lot of the audience did. The audience that was in the cinema with us, it wasn't, like as I said in a few of my other videos pre previously, whenever I got to the cinema now, it's not busy anymore, the cinema. The cinema used to be rammed. When I went to see like the, the original Screams in the cinema, every time you go, the audience on the opening weekend would be packed it would be like you tr you're scrambling to try and get a ticket you possibly might not get a ticket you might have to go to a show in later to try and get to see it that doesn't happen anymore you turn up at the cinema and the majority of the seats are empty and this is friday night eight o'clock on a friday night prime cinema time and there's no one there so it is worrying for the cinema i'm not sure how they're still going i do think they're the kind of the their own downfall because you look at the price of a ticket now you can understand why people aren't going to the cinema much anymore Take your family, it'll cost you near on 60 quid now to go to the cinema, and it's ridiculous. So, gone are the days when it was a cheap date night out of the cinema. This is, it is sad that it's, it's become this. So, where are we? So, one good thing about when I went to cinema, I went to Cineworld Cinema in Ashford, and I got a free poster. <laughs> Look at that, how good is that? I didn't see it in 4DX, but they were obviously advertising their 4DX. But this poster is great, I love that. Without, if that 40X weren't there, that would be one of the, that would, do you know what, I still want to go up on my wall. I want to put this in the front room, I'm going to get a frame and put that in my front room, so I do enjoy that post. I might see if I can get it online without the, the 4, the X bit on it, but that is, for free, just for, just for turning up at the cinema, that is brilliant, I like that. So yeah, let's get into the film, let's get into what happened. So, sometimes when I do these reviews, I like to like, break down the film in chronological order of the film. This one, I'm just going to basically go for points of the film that I liked and points that I didn't like because there are a few points I didn't like and I didn't understand why they went the way they did but let's get into it so let's start with the opening so we'll start at the start the opening of the film is different from other screen films normally you get the opening you get the, the phone call from the killer if someone's in the house phone call from the killer the person gets killed obviously in the previous film we didn't have that we had a survivor from the opening what's the opening kill we had a survivor in general Ortega I'll get on to more about her later so in this one, we see a woman in a bar who, I know this actress has said this before, but she looks the spitting image of the girl that plays Harley Quinn, but it's not her. It's sort of a double take moment. It's like, have they got her to be in it? And then you realise it's not her. It's the girl that looks a lot like her, who's probably a little bit less successful than her, if that makes sense. Anyway, so she's in a bar. The person who's supposed to be meeting is obviously like a blind date thing or an internet date thing. So she's um, on the phone to him. He's messaging on a bit late. I can't find the place. She then goes outside, walks down an alleyway to try and find him, and then goes for, then the ghost face voice starts to the other guy's voice, and she gets stabbed to quite violently. I mean, the thing about this film, the, the killings in Scream are quite violent, but they seem to be getting more physically like, mm, like in. They like really, almost like sinking it in a bit more now in these things. I suppose they've got the technology with the blaze, and they've got the, the lightweight armor and they can wear underneath their clothes. They can really sink these hits in without them doing damage to the actors and actresses. So I liked that. I really did like that fact. Now we've got, oh, where are we? I've lost my place. I've got some notes. I've not got many notes. So this is what it is, one page. So, yeah, so it gets killed. But then they do his thing. And I was like, I literally gasped when this happened. So the killer kills the person and then he takes his mask off and we see the killer in the opening scene. And I'm like, this isn't Scream. This isn't supposed to happen. Like the whole point of Scream for me is always the, the whodunit aspect. 
So not only are you watching a horror slasher movie, you're also watching a whodunit, because the whole way through the film, you're trying to work out which one of these people is it. Because you know it's one of them, but you're trying to work out which one it is. So I was like, why? They've just revealed it. Like, that's that's the whole point of Scream. But then we sort of follow this killer hut back to where he lives, and he lives in the college campus. And as he's walking along, you see, um, what's it, Tara Carpenter, which is General Tager's character, so I walk past and have a little moment with her. Hello, how are you? We're going to go to a party. Okay, I'll come with you. I'll come back, back by later. See that bye. And they have that sort of moment. So they obviously know each other. And he walks off. He has a stone look. Oh, by the way, the guy that does the killing is Flash Thompson from the new Spider-Man movies. Because that's what the first thing I was like. When he took the mask, I was like, it's Flash Thompson. <laughs> he's the killer. So Flash Thompson's the killer. So he's then going back home. He gets home and he sits down and the phone rings. And it's his friend who's supposed to be killing with him. But obviously... This guy's got a little bit anxious and gone out and done it before him. So he's like, first of all, I just want to say I'm sorry. I got, he refers to it as blue balls. And I had to go out and do this killing. I couldn't wait any longer. I'm sorry, blah, blah, blah. And the, the guy on the phone is using the ghost face voice as well. And then he gets a bit like, is this the guy I know? So you sort of, I'm wondering now where is this going? And suddenly I think, is he now going to get killed? Because I actually think that. So then the ghost face voice is pretending to be his friend says like, We'll do warmer, colder. We'll play the game warmer, colder. Sort of. So this guy stands up and he's like, walks a bit. And he's like, Yo, you're warmer. Walks a bit. You're colder. We're back the other way. You're warmer. And he leads him to a fridge. He opens the fridge and in it is the guy he's supposed to be on the phone to. But he's all mangled up and chopped up and dead like that in the fridge. And then you see a killer come from behind and stab him. So we've now got a killer that's just killed the killer. And I was like, well, this film's just blown it wide open. This is very different from the other screens. So then we've got a... Then we sort of go sort of what's happening with our... We go back to our core four, as they've now nicknamed themselves. So, yeah, the core four are um, the two Carpenter sisters, Tara and Sam, and you've got the two twins, which are Randy's niece and nephew, the, the, the survivors from the previous screen. So then... That, and they, and the, guy, the the male twin, he comes up with this idea of being... I think they named the core four, being like they're like the, the, the group, the new sort of like... The new legacy characters, if you would. They're the ones that sort of replace the old legacy characters of like Gail, Dewey, I suppose you could Randy, and even though he dies in the second one, and um, Sid would be the four. So now we've got the core four of this new core four. And their dynamics actually quite good. And all the actors in that core four, I think, are pretty good, save for maybe the guy one. He kind of like, he's there to look, look good. He's a very good looking sort of guy, muscular, like, He's kind of a, that's kind of what he's, he's the eye candy. I mean, they're all quite attractive people, but he's the eye candy. So you've got the carp. you see sort of um, Sam Carpenter, she's going to a therapist, and she's very much like trying to deal with everything that's happened to her. We find out her dad's a serial killer, Billy Loomis. We find that from the last, spoiler from the last film, we've just seen the previous film, Billy Loomis was her dad, she found, found this out. And she's got a lot of his, I suppose, I suppose they're trying to say that like, psychosis the sort of the, like being a psychopath is kind of like genetic and it's gone into her but she's kind of fighting against that and she's on medication for it and she's been speaking to a therapist and she's not actually mentioned this bit i actually did find quite funny she's not mentioned her past and what the reason she's there for she's going to a therapist and the therapist says to her look just tell me everything and so she does and then the therapist is like well i'm not qualified to deal with this i'm just going to leave this here i'm not qualified to deal with any of this this isn't my line of work and he's sort of like Basically, doesn't want to be a therapist anymore. And I thought that was hilarious. So now we've got a bit of a, a, a sister sort of struggle where Sam is very protective over Tara, being the younger sister. And like, he's kind of not wanting to sort of, sort of trying to control her life. Like, you must stay in all the time. You must only go out with me. Or you must have a taser with you at all times. Like, so we get a lot of that going on. So that's the, that's the struggle with the two sisters. So they're trying to live their life out and. Uh, university and they've got a f you start to see the people that were the the red herring people like, who are the killers start popping up here and there they've got a friend who's kind of geeky into film so you you obviously think of billy and stew at that point they've got a roommate who's kind of like seems to be sleeping with a lot of people um you've got you've got all the classic horror tropes like the um the twin the girl the twin she's got a girlfriend who's very very pretty sort of so you sort of like he's you're trying to work out who they are. So they've got a group of friends around them. And this film very much arcs back to Scream 2. So if you think about the way they're doing these recalls, as they coined the phrase in the last film, is that Scream 5 was technically a reboot sequel of Scream 1. So it all took place in like, school students being hacked up by 
their fellow students and, and, and her boyfriend. So it's very much similar to that. Scream 2 was set in a college campus. This movie is set in a college campus. So you can see they're arcing back. Now, when I realised this, when sitting in the cinema, I suddenly thought to myself, I think the killer is going to be related to the killer from the previous film. That thought just hit me in the head like a bolt of lightning. And then a little bit later on, this is where... Now, I worked out who the killers were as soon as this line was said. As soon as this line was said, I was like, you're a killer. And then when they mentioned someone else, I was like, that person's in it with you. So, and as I said, this is a spoiler review. So I'm now going to spoil right now who the killer was. And we'll get into sort of the killer side of it and what I thought of them. So what they did is they've decided that the, the killer is going to be this time. The family, the the family of Richie, I think his name was, who was the killer in the previous film. It was Sam's boyfriend who would... That, that in itself was a weird sort of thing because this guy, they sort of build his backstory up on this one. I like that they give him more of a backstory in this one as well to why he was what he was. So this guy basically, from the previous film, was obsessed with the Stab franchise of films, which are the films that are based on what happened in the screen movies. Put it sign of a world within a world. So they are... So I'm, yeah, so they are, um, yes, yeah, so that's what they do. They sort of build his character. So it turns out, as you find out near the end, that this, this I think he's, I swear his name is Richie. If I'm wrong, I'm very sorry. But he was obsessed with these films. So obsessed that he used to make his own versions of them. And he has like a, a museum monument to him, like a shrine they refer to it. It's more like a little museum based on these killings. He's got all the original outfits from the King Summer. He's got all the evidence from it and all that. And he then decides to make his own one. But to do this, he, must, he he tracks down, somehow he finds out that Billy Loomis's daughter is Sam. He then manages to get into a relationship with her and manages to date her, even though looking, he's kind of well out of the league, really. But he, he gets in a relationship with her, dates her, gets her to go back to Woodsboro, and then starts this killing spree in Woodsboro. So it's kind of, it's a bizarre to bizarre way of being but he's they sort of give you that backstory in this that he used to make his movies he has this shrine he was obsessed with the stab movies and his family sort of went along with this so now you've got his family are now coming back for revenge and that's basically the ending we find this out at the end of the film that it's his family have come back for revenge now the reason i worked this out very early on is because i said that light bulb went off that it's going to follow the same vein as scream 2 being and i had a feeling it was going to be a relative of one of the killers from the previous film and the second the roommate says, my dad's been upset since my brother died, I was like, bang, there's my killer. And then they tried to throw me off by killing the killer, but I was like, she ain't dead, this is bull crap. And when you realise that her dad is the police officer as well, I was like, I'm starting to work this all out now. And my brain started doing the whole like, ticking away like in that, that TV show Sherlock where he's like and you can see that was me in the cinema going and I didn't say anything to my partner I just wanted to keep it going and every time they tried to throw a red herring in like with the certain characters that pop up I'd be like nope I'm still thinking it's that person nope it's still that person and then at the end when things start to pan out just before the reveal I was like it's not her. like they tried to basically that one the copper guy says that Someone isn't an FBI agent when they are. And that's when I was like, I knew I was right. And the second the mask come off, obviously, I'm right. Although, saying that I was right, I was right on two of them. I didn't expect there to be a third killer. First time ever we have a third killer in a Scream franchise. Well, technically we had five, really. If you count the two that were going to start off as the killers. And then they get killed by the three killers. And then you've got the three killers. So technically, we have five killers in a film, in a scream film. So there we go. It's a bit different, but yeah. So the three, the main three, that sort of trio of the family members who are all nuts, by the way. So the whole thing is screamed with with psychopaths running generations. Obviously, that's true because this this whole family are nuts. So yeah. So we'll get onto the the ending a bit later. So we will talk about the cast now. We're going to talk about the new cast. So there's new the new characters are. Fantastic. I like all the new characters. I like their development in this. I like the sort of underlying story of the sisters, sort of like the overprotective because of what happened in the past, dealing with their trauma from the previous film. That's good. I love the um I love the, the, the aspect of the internet as well on, on Sam's character where 
even though we know what happened with Sam, the internet rumours are going around that she planned the killings in the first one. She's really busy doing she's daughter in full and she's actually a killer as well. So people don't trust her and that. I like the fact there's that going on. And then you find out that the killer is the one that started the rumour as well. The actual killers in this are the ones that started that rumour to sort of like make her look bad as well. So I thought that was... And to build their ultimate plot of having her... Their revenge on her as well, even after she's dead. So there's that. So... Now we're going to get into the legacy cast members, and there's pretty much only one left in Courtney Cox, because we know Nev Campbell had a pay dispute and didn't end up in the movie, which, fair enough, I do think she should be getting paid a lot of money, because she's kind of like the glue, was the glue of the franchise, it kind of like, you felt like you couldn't work without her, yet this film kind of proves it can go on without her, so that's kind of a bit of, maybe shot herself in the foot, but I know she'll be back, eventually they'll go, like, do you know what, we need her back for a film, we're going to throw a load of money at her and she'll come back, and she and she, right, she should get the money because she's the reason we've been watching these films from the start. She's the final girl from the first one. She's the reason the killers keep coming back in the other one. So, to be honest with you, I get it. So, um, yeah, so let's get on to Gail Webbers. I'm not sure if they knew Gail Webbers was going to be in this movie or not because if you took every scene with Gail Webbers out of it, nothing would change in this movie. It wouldn't do anything to the storyline. It's almost like maybe she was in the dispute as well and they kind of wrote her out of the movie and then when she was like, I'll come back, they then rewrote her back in but didn't change any of the rest of the plot because it did feel like you couldn't, she didn't need to be in it. It was kind of felt like she was, she almost felt out of place in this one. I know she's a legacy character and, and being the fans of the franchise, we want her, we want legacy characters in it because it gives us that nostalgic feeling from when we first watched it. I remember being a, like, it was my late teens going to watch the first Scream films and I was massive into horror at the time so it kind of like, I feel like this film was made for me, like being the horror fan that I was at the time as well. I was kind of roughly their age as well. So that's that's why I love these films so much, because it's kind of like grown with it and now I've got the new generation. So I'm very, I like the fact she's in it, but it was kind of like, it felt like it was out of place and it, it did feel like they just sort of added her into it and it didn't need to be, like you definitely didn't need that part. You could easily delete her out, as I said, and you wouldn't notice. So it's kind of a shame that she wasn't more integral the other legacy characters in this film, you have Kirby, who's coming back from Scream 4. She's the person in Scream 4 that everyone wished hadn't died, and now we find out she didn't die, which we kind of found in the last one, because there was a there was a little Easter egg in the last film where they were looking through like Scream videos, and you saw Survivor's story from Kirby. So everyone was like, oh my God, she didn't die, and everyone was really happy about it, and the Scream fans, because she was a good character. So now she's back for this one, and she's she's joined the FBI. Obviously, she's been stabbed in the first one, so she's got in the in the last in the fourth one. So now she's joined the FBI, probably because she's kind of got that Batman thing. Like, oh, I've got to try and stop him from anyone else. So she becomes a criminal investigator and a psychopath in the FBI. A bit of a molder and Scully. Um, but whenever I hear the word FBI, I keep hearing Shanna Reeves say it in Point Break. So when it's like, here's the FBI, I still it's a weird like trigger for me where I, I then hear Keanu's like, I am an FBI. B I agent, and for some reason, every time I hear the word FBI, even though I'm a massive X Files fan before that, whenever I hear the word FBI, that echoes in my head. So it, as soon as they said, "Oh, we got the FBI here," I was like, oh, now "I could just see Keanu Reeves just bursting in the room." Like, oh, I'm an FBI agent. Anyway, so we've now got our legacy characters. Also, we've got um, Billy Loomis back, the discreet, doing his like younger face looking version of himself in reflections and that, which. It's part of um, Sam's psychosis where she sees her dad every so often, like in, I suppose, like a schizophrenia thing, I don't know, like a, where she can visualise her dad talking to her. And he kind of, he's kind of like an Obi-Wan Kenobi in the weirdest way, because even in the one before that, he's like, go for the kill. Like he, he, he eggs her on to kill, but she's kind of doing it in a hero way. So she's taking this like villainous character and psychopath, but she turns it, into a good use so that part of her dad the dad part of her inside her comes out when she needs it the most it's kind of like the incredible hulk or something where this like rage comes out and she just uses it in in the perfect time to use it in a in the, the way to save her and her sister and stuff so we've got obi-wan billy loomis <laughs> who but he does kind of advise her and he's like go on you know you want to grab the knife it's to her he says to her like when she's in the the at the end of the film, they're basically in like a, what they call a kill box, where they sort of set up a, a place where no one can get in or out and they can kill the killer, and it turns out it gets switched on his head, it's all a big trap for them. But because Sam's watching what's going on around her, she's not, and Kirby's like, I've got the gun, I'm the only one with a gun, 
like I'm the only one allowed to use it because I'm an FBI agent. So then you see Sam go up to Billy's like shrine thing because okay, I'll get onto this now. There is a shrine in the movie. Our original killer, for, well, not original killer, our killer from the previous movie. I swear his name's Richie. I'm probably totally wrong if we're going Stephen or something. But he, but he had a shrine built because he's obsessed with these films, and he had. Everything from the real life killing. So he had every suit from every ghost face from the previous films. Now this, so there's a cabinet with Billy's original ghost face suit. And the mark, well, had the mask, they put the mask on. And she, Sam walks up to it and she sees her dad's reflection in the glass. And at this pivotal point where they're, so they're in this like kill box room thing. And Billy says to her, you need to look around. You need to get your weapon and sort yourself out, like be ready for this because something's about to happen. So then she takes Billy's old knife and she's holding his old knife. He's still got blood in it. I didn't get that. Surely you'd wipe that off, but he's still got very fresh looking blood in it. I don't know if it's pretend. I don't know what it was, but she's then got this knife. So that's a sort of, okay. Yeah. So Kirby, let's talk back on to Kirby. Kirby is a great character in this film. She's still the same character we saw before, but she's obviously matured a lot more. So she's got a different way of thinking of things. And as the sort of like, she's cut, she's not the legacy character in the sense where she's from the original, but she's definitely from a love screen film. Because Scream 4 is a lot of people's opinion, including my own, I think. If I was to rank the screen film, Scream 1 is obviously the top because Scream 1 is fantastic. And it's got a nostalgia feeling. But Scream 4, I think, is the best sequel. I do think Scream 4 was the best sequel in that, like, before we got the requels. I think Scream 4 is definitely the best sequel. I did like the requel as well. I think any time Scream films take a stab at what's going on in cinema, as in like the new fad, they're a good film. So like obviously the Scream 4 was taking the mickey out of the reboots that were happening, especially the Wes Craven reboots, so all of them were awful. And then we've got Scream 5 was taking a stab at the re Boots like the Ghostbusters Afterlife, your Star Wars, Force Awakens. He's, he's taking shots at those. So we've got that going on. So, which is good. So yeah, the Kirby influence on this one was very, very good. And they gave her a lot more to do than I thought they would. And the big twist that is she the killer? Because then you get the, the, the like, oh no, she's not an FBI agent when well, they fired her because she went nuts after the last killings. So then you believe she might be the killer. But there's a lot involved in that. And it is it's very well done, that bit. So, yeah, I knew the key was right. Now, we'll get on to the end. So basically, the ending, when the big reveal happens, the ending is very good because we get a lot of closure in the ending, kind of. So we get, we find out the killer of the family of the killer from the previous film. We find out it's the dad. We find out it's the Quinn, the, the roommate, who we thought was already dead. But obviously the dad covers that up so she can then go around doing more killings. And it's also the geeky friend, which I did not see that coming. I did not see him part of it. But, and it's kind of like, I didn't get him at first. I was like, why is, why him? And then he says, oh, that we're all a family. We, they're basically, it's a revenge story. They, their son was killed by Sam. They now want revenge on Sam. So then they decide to become killers and kill everyone. It's kind of, a, it's a weird way of doing it. It's a very bizarre <laughs> sort of twist of the story. But it was all right. So they go around. And then you get the big fight at the end with the killers trying to chase everyone and the slow like, the killers get the one up and then the heroes get the one up and the killers get the one up. But this basically ends up with just General Ortega and Sam, sorry, General Ortega, Tara and Sam running around this like theatre slash shrine to the screen thing, trying to sort of fight off the baddies. And I was like, this is very, very, very good. I enjoyed the ending. It was thrilling. It was exciting. And you get a kind of a Sam Tara closure because there's a bit where Tara's fallen over a balcony. Sam's got hold of her and she's trying to pull her up. But she's quite, it's hard to pull someone up. So she's trying to pull her up and the killer's at the bottom trying to slash at her. From, oh, she's a bit too high up to slash. And Tara looks up at Sam and says like, you need to let me go. Because that was the whole point where Sam was so con like controlling over Tara's life. And she'd said to her alone, like, you need to start letting me go. You need to let me live my life. I can't for my whole life because of what happened in the past. I can't be that terrified anymore. So she's hanging over the edge. You get this moment where they're looking at each other. She's like, you've got to let me go. And she look, and Tara looks at Sam's pocket where Billy Loomis's knife is stashed in her thing. She you need to let me go. And she's like, and Sam says, I trust you. I know you can handle yourself. And she passes her the knife. 
and she lets go and she just drops down with the knife sort of stabbing away at the, the guy underneath so there's that sort of like that sort of like message of sort of like you can't control someone forever you have to let them go you have to let them breathe so and you have to trust that they can get on themselves and every like every parent has that with their children like i'm i've now gone through with my daughter when she went to university it's sort of like well now she's over there and she doesn't have a mum she doesn't have me she's kind of on her own in this university but she's doing fantastically well i'll not lie my daughter is doing amazingly well at university she's got her own little life now she's got her own little job She's got her head screwed on anyway. She always has done, but she's she's and like you know, I talk I talk to her all the time. But she she doesn't need us to have that control over her. Like I was always very mindful. I didn't want to be like her anyway. Like I was growing up, like but as a parent, you protect and you nurture. And then when you have to let them go, it's kind of a it's a big step for you. It's not. I mean, they're having this massive life step where they're now going out on their own. But it's a massive step for you as a parent as well because you have to hold yourself back from like I just want to like like could be there and all that but you know you have to let them make their own choices their own decisions you can advise but you can no longer tell them what to do anymore so this is what this situation here is it's almost like she's letting go of that and like boom it's like metaphoric I suppose you could say so then so we get our killings and we get them and take down the baddies and etc like in every screen film they then take down the baddies but the way that because of with Sam's character being Loomis's daughter and having that psychopath in her, when she takes down a killer, she takes down a killer. She goes sick to death, like crazy with the old blood and that. But I did feel like where Sam was the front of the film last time as the hero side, and I'm not, I mean, obviously this was filmed about the same around the time when, because Wednesday came out first, so they knew Wednesday was going to be coming out. Jenna Ortega's character of Tara is now on level with Sam as hero. So I don't know if that's because they knew the Wednesday was coming out, how big that was going to be, or because they, maybe there was a few rewrites after the success of Wednesday, that now Jenna Ortega's gone from being like here to here with Sam, where before she was the little sister, almost like the, the scared little sister. Now she's like, they've made her, by the end of this film, she's now there. So when they go again, it might even, I don't know, because of the, again, you, you they want to make money from the film, so they're going to want to make their most famous person in this movie, which at this current time is Jenna Ortega. It's, she's more famous than Courtney Cox even in this film at this point, because Wednesday's blown up so big, it's this phenomenon, it's massive. That's why she's now in this film, and that's why she's become more in this movie and in this franchise. She will now go on to become a massive part of this franchise. She's not going to be out of any of these movies now. Unless she wants more money. And they like no. But um yeah, so right, so the thing now we're gonna get on right, so the there are the things I kind of liked about the movie. I like this movie. I will not like I like this movie. There are some things though that when I come out I was like it's kind of pissed me off a bit and it's kind of it's annoying because we see people in this film get stabbed multiple times and I'm talking, I'm not just talking like a, uh, oh, a little bit. We are talking like that, that, that. And they stay alive. Too many people in this film stay alive. I want to see a lot more people die. I'll, I'll have been quite happy seeing the twins die. The twins should be dead. What happens to the twins in this movie, they should be dead. The one on the train should be dead. The fact she was left alone with the killer... She should be dead. The brother twin. He, the way he was stabbed, no one lives through that. Now, I grew up in a quite a rough area. I, I know of people, I know of a lot of stabbings in my area. None of them really go that well. But if someone was stabbed like that, they are dead. There is no question that he's, he was being stabbed in every organ. He was being stabbed multiple times. He is not alive. You could buy Dewey surviving Scream 1. You can buy him surviving Scream 2 because they say he stabbed him in scar tissue. But when you get into Scream 5, you know he's dead. There's no chance. In this film, as I said, you've got the twins that survive it in, and Gail that survives. Because we find at the very end, Gail is still alive. They do it. This is what I mean. Well, I don't know if she was in this film or not. Because at the end, he's like, oh yeah, Gail's still alive. And that, that's all they mention. You don't go back to Gail and see her in hospital alive and talking. You see her possibly dead with the paramedics working on her, it's the last time you see Gail, and then you just get a throwaway call at the end, like, yeah, she's still alive. 
And I was just like, well, that sucks, because there's no real big payoff for that. I thought you'd get a sarky comment from Gal or something at the end, but no. And I, and I will be honest, I was fully expecting a something from Nev Campbell at some point, but it never happened. But I was expecting like a phone call at the end with a voice or a video call or something like that. I was expecting that with Gal and, and Sid. But no, nothing like that at all. So literally, it's just a throwaway comment in Gal still alive. And so then we go to them bringing out uh, the, the male, I'm sorry, I can't remember, you know, the male twin comes out on the stretcher and he's bearing in mind we saw him get, how he got stabbed we saw it happen and how nasty it was and i've just had a thought we'll get back to that in a minute so we saw him stabbing and how nasty it was and he's on the stretcher he's being pulled out and he's still alive and i was like are you kidding me like no and then you see his sister bounce onto the set like who who had been out an hour maybe before this or maybe two hours before this stabbed a few times in a train in the stomach now we all know from just from films in general that being stabbed or shot in the stomach is one of the most painful things you can go through we know that just from medical stuff as well like all the organ she had been stabbed in the stomach like in pulled up a bit in and now she's like oh my god my brother's still alive i'm gonna run in the ambulance and see if it's like i was like what the f what it took it took me out of the movie. The end, the very end in the film, took me right out of the movie, and I was just saying like, "What the? F like, Gal, everyone's still alive. <laughs> Basically, everyone is alive. The boyfriend, who I'm don't know if he's going to be more in the next one. So I haven't mentioned him actually. So Sam has a secret boyfriend, who was I remember him from Arrow because I remember my friend met him at a convention. And I remember he, he quite liked his character as well. But he was a baddie in Arrow, one of the series seasons of Arrow. And he was a very good baddie, actually, as well. He's in this. And you could write him out of it. And you wouldn't even notice. Because there's no point in him being in it either. Because he doesn't do anything to the, the story. He's just there as like a red herring. But no point. Could have written him out of it and you wouldn't even notice. But I don't know if they're building for an, the next film. I don't know if this is part of the next film. So the only thing I can think of when it comes to those twins... And this is a theory I had when I was at school about Dewey. And if it's going to be that, then it's going to be insane, right? So my theory on the twins is that they're the killers. Or not the killers, they are planning this. Now, they're film obsessed, right? We know the, the sister is film obsessed. Is she planning all of this and setting it up? So I originally thought that in the, when the build-up for Scream 3 was happening, and me and my friends were talking about it, my theory was that Dewey is the killer, ultimately the killer, that he loves horror movies and he's, he wants to watch them take place. So he doesn't want to be the killer, he wants to be the director. That's what I thought Dewey was. And that was and this whole like, facade of Dewey was an act. And the fact that he survived every time was part of, him watching these movies unfold they kind of did that in scream 3 so i was like shocked that my idea was kind of like happening like the theory i had was happening but they did with someone different and i do still think it would be better if it turned out dewey was the killer in this that would have linked a trilogy in a way it would contain that trilogy and maybe scream 3 would have been better than it was so i wonder if that's the twins thing now that they are kind of like sitting back watching these things take place and it's a big thing of theirs maybe they're filming them as well in some way but they're watching all these take place it's all them controlling it i don't know that's what i'd like it to be because that would explain why they survive every time that explain maybe she wasn't stabbed it was all fake it's part of the thing but i don't know in that sense why that because it was obviously the killer on the train with her i don't know i don't understand so that's the thing that out of everything in this film, that's the thing that really wound me up. The fact that no one seems to die from horrific stab injuries that should be killing people. And especially that one girl twin that seems to bounce back like nothing's happened. That's my problem with this. That's the only problem I had when watching this film. So yeah, that's, this is basically my spoiler. I, said, I'm, I kind of jumped back and forward a bit. I know it'll probably got to be confusing. But that's what I believe this... I do like this film. I did enjoy it. I'm glad I went to cinema to see it. I am worried about cinemas. I do think cinemas are going to become a thing of the past soon or they're going to they're going to have to change something soon because they're trying to get technology in there to try and make cinemas better. So they're doing like, they're doing 4DX and things like that. I, 
they've got like Screen X in the cinema I'm at now. They've got IMAX and things like to try and get people to come back. But I don't think it's working because they're charging so much money. The cinema was the perfect date night, as in like an early on date night. It was a perfect thing because it was an, it wasn't expensive. So you could go out with your partner to the cinema. You used to spend like I suppose like a fiver or something, and then you'd watch the film and you'd enjoy it. And it was good. And you could then go out for a meal after. Now, you got, you have to save up to go out to the cinema. Like, I've got, in total, like six children, basically. In total, I've got two stepchildren and four of my own. So, to take them all to the cinema, it's going it to, to take all of them, including myself and my partner, it's going to cost over £100 on tickets. You know, that's a lot of money. And then, obviously, part of the cinema experience is you want your popcorn you want your drink you know you want that's part of the cinema experience and that's then becomes over well over a hundred pound for me to take my whole family to the cinema and it is insane that that's what it is now you know the cinema was supposed to be the cheap night out the cheap like type way to take kids but sadly it's not i mean it, i took my kids to see avatar because it is a family film and it cost me a bloody fortune to do it and it's just, it's insane that we have to do this nowadays, that it's this much money. And I think that's what's stopping people going to the cinema, because the amount of people, whenever someone says, I went to the cinema, I've been for a while, and they, the first thing they say is how much the ticket prices were. It's like ridiculous. Because like, say they're like, like I know people that are like big Elvis fans, and they haven't been to the cinema since well before lockdown, because they just don't go to the cinema. They're, they're, up, they're older people. And then they've gone, oh, I, want to, I like Elvis, so I'll, go, so I'll treat myself and go to the cinema. And they're like, it cost me 15 pounds to see a bloody film. You can buy it on DVD when it comes out for cheaper, and you can, that's the whole point. And then you have it, and you can watch it as thousand times as you want. The cinema, for some reason, they think it's okay to charge this. And sadly, I don't think it'll be, if they went backwards and went, Joe, you know what, we're gonna go back, being five pound a ticket. I think they'll do better then. Or they'll go back to being like, we're gonna be like a couple of quid a ticket, drinks are still extortionate prices. They do that, that's fine. But it is such, such a shame. And especially when you pay that money and the film's crap, and then you feel like you want your money back because you just spent. So I'd gone to see a film with my whole family. It's cost me over a hundred pound, and the film is awful, and no one liked it. You can't get your money back for that. You can't go look. I watched this film. It's awful. I want my money back. They're going. They're not going to give you your money back. You should. That might be a thing, but then everyone would take the pick, and you should see the greatest film ever, and you still say you didn't like it. Get your money back. Anyway, that's my rant over about cinemas. So yes, Scream Six. Definitely go and watch it if I. Obviously, this was a spoiler, so hopefully you haven't watched it yet, and you're now you have watched it. And we, we're having this discussion about it. If you've got any of your own feelings about it, please put it in the comments. I do like to see what other people think of the films. Um, I've had a few comments people saying they like my reviews and stuff. Thank you very much for that. But I also like comments where we actually talk. I like to have a conversation. So if you've got anything about the film, where you watch the film, you think, you know what? I like this bit of the film. I like that bit of the film. I disagree that I like the fact they all survive at the end. So I like those characters. Please do that. But I do think we... Because now I'm starting to think that Ghostface isn't that much of a threat if everyone keeps living. You don't feel like he's going to kill everyone now. But anyway, guys. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all soon. And... Oh, let's hope there's another screen film coming soon, which I'm pretty sure there will be. Especially because of this one and the previous one. And don't forget, if you are going to see well, try and ask them if they've got any of these free posters. Because they are pretty phenomenal. And it's completely free. And judging the price of your ticket, you technically pay for it anyway. Anyway, guys. See you soon. Have a good one. Bye.